They're going to talk about uh, the vendor as a path to market. I've talked about this a few times through the day. Uh, we had Amdocs up mentioning that they do that. We had Huawei showing how they can be a path to market. So we're going to drill down into that subject because for any kind of entrepreneur startup trying to sell into the telecom industry, there, it's a very reasonable path. In fact, many tales I've heard of from startups are, I had a great deal. I was talking to Carrier X. They were about to say yes. And as they said yes, they said, yes, but I want to buy you through my tier one vendor. So even after doing the process independently, a lot of startups get pushed to work through the vendor because the carriers want to work with their reliable suppliers. We heard from this incubator that problem. If you're a young startup, the carrier is going to say, yeah, I can't really handle you. You're too young. I can't have confidence in your being around. But if you sell your technology through an Ericsson, a Huawei, uh, an Amdocs, I'm going to feel much more comfortable. So it's a lot, makes a lot of sense then for the startups to think about that potential path to market right from the start. So this next panel is going to dive into it. I'd like to invite up Michael Howard from IHS. He's an analyst. He's our capable moderator for this session. Michael. Thank Great. Thank you. And as Michael uh, introduced himself, I'd like to ask his panelists to take your seats behind and you can go straight. Oh, hi. Uh, I know many of you in the room and many of you I don't. So my name is Michael Howard. I was a co-founder of Infonetics Research in 1990 and a year and a half ago we got acquired by a big company, IHS, uh, and so I'm now with IHS. I've been tracking over my uh, history all sorts of the carrier network from the optical transport and the uh, uh, carrier uh, service provider routers and switches. In the last five years, I've focused on SDN and NFE. So I've watched a lot, I've worked with a lot of carriers, I've worked with a lot of vendors, and watched this process, worked with a lot of startups and a lot of startups that are no longer startups, but they're small private companies. So today we have a distinguished panel. I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce them, self-introduce themselves uh, to start with. Uh, do you wanna start? Sure. So, Diomedes? Uh, yeah, sure. My name is uh, Diomedes. Uh, I'm heading uh, innovation for Ericsson Globally. Um, my background is coming from a startup world. Uh, um, I entered Ericsson through an acquisition um, and um, now in the last one year, I'm responsible for innovation, both from an incubation perspective and investment perspective. I'm Sanjeev Mirvana, I represent Cisco. I'm head of service provider marketing for service provider portfolio. I've been working with bringing out new products as well as working with partners, as well as with a lot of operators in looking at their requirements and so forth. Hi, I'm Dave Widener. I head up our ARM's operator relations team. Uh, within ARM uh, is the company, right? ARM is an IP provider. We provide a lot of IP. We actually don't necessarily make chips, but we're well known for the chips that are produced with our IP. Um, our model is really around building partnerships and building out the ecosystem then that various partners can then actually take product to market. Good afternoon. I am Laurent Le Gourierec. I lead the strategic partnerships for Nokia. On before this, for Alcatel Lucent, I was in charge of the technology assessments, which means I worked for years with startups, made a few acquisitions, a lot of investments, and I still represent the company at the board of various funds uh, where Nokia has invested. Great, thanks. Uh, so the first question, of course, is how have you worked with startups? And give us some examples of how you've helped introduce startups to carriers. And I guess there's several models of how you do it, a partnership, a minor investment, acquisition, there may be other variants of that, but what are some uh, real examples? Do you wanna start, Diomedes? Sure, um, as I said, I mean, within Ericsson, we have a three-pronged strategy when it comes to innovation, right? There is a lot of invention happening around the world. Our main task and our main challenge is to turn that invention to uh, innovation. That's pri primarily looking at the commercialization of uh, this invention. So we're using three prone strategy when it comes to that. One is incubation. Uh, that would be internal integrated projects utilizing startups. We have a few examples on that, uh, where we try to scale a solution within Ericsson Shell in order to scale it up to the operator space. The second one would be the strategic investments, um, where either through startup accelerators or through direct uh, strategic investments to startups that we choose within Ericsson domain, we do a minority or majority investment or we lead. And the third one is acquisition. So on the acquisition side, I would say in the last five years, we have been very, very active on the media space. 
Um, that is something that is crossing our networks about 90% projected profit by 2020. Right now it's around 70% of video distributed systems. So we have been very active on that. Our latest acquisition was um, Microsoft from Microsoft Media Room, which is an IPTV solution and we're trying to scale it to a cloud-based solution. Uh, and of course, other areas as well, cloud, we have been very active. Um, and on the, on the investment side, I mean, recently we announced a few investments on the real-time uh, operation side, like PubNub, Resin, Heterogeneous DevOps, and of course, incubation, we work with diff different startups on the operator domain. Good. Uh, Sanjeev. Yeah, so uh, from a Cisco's perspective, very similarly, we have build, buy, and partner strategy as well. Obviously, there's a lot of innovation that happens in-house. But specifically, as we work uh, with operators, all kinds of different operators, be it web scale companies or telecommunication providers, there's an aspect of co-development. And that's where you know, a lot of examples occur about how we would partner or how we would address a specific challenge to address their business outcomes. I mean, specific examples, it's not just always that the carrier would recommend a specific partner, but sometimes, you know, as part of our investment strategy, we are also introducing that technology to the operator based on that requirement. If I give a couple of examples of where we have been very uh, having that discussion uh, with uh, many of the operators is around, you know, the aspect of NFE, SDN, uh, talking about automation, talking about simplification, a lot of discussion around network simplification and so forth. And uh, we have been active uh, in that area. You know, TLF is a good example, Michael. Uh, Keridin is another one. So, yeah. Let me just dig in a little bit. My yeah. view of what happened with Cisco and TLF was that I first heard about TLF with uh, Deutsche Telekom's TerraStream project in Croatia. It was one of the very first actual SDN deployments and it was all Cisco. Well, it wasn't all Cisco. There was this little company called Taylor, a little Swedish company. And uh, so that, I don't know, I think Deutsche Telekom introduced you to Taylor, I think, don't know. But then later on, it was AT&T was certainly encouraging Taylor to get purchased. And I think they approached Cisco and maybe Ericsson, maybe some others. I, I understand we're in the bidding process, but can you tell us, uh, what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, I can't, that side obviously, of the story? <laughs> you can't go into specifics, but like I said, depending on certain environments, either an operator introduces a technology uh, for various reasons, or they want a specific vendor to go after a certain technology. Uh, in this kind of environment, you know, specifically you mentioned about Deutsche Telekom. Uh, you know, the, the whole project Cisco was driving from a services, service creation perspective and how that can help working in partnership with Deutsche Telekom. Obviously, Deutsche Telekom have their own uh, arm of where they are also innovating and working with a lot of incubating uh, technologies. And that's how sometimes things work together. That's how, you know, uh, the discussion started as well. I think Deutsche Telekom had a chance to invest in TLF, but they didn't. But that's a story for Michael Bolshammer, who may or may not be in the audience right now. Dave. Yeah, um, so from an ARM perspective, right, as I kind of mentioned, you know, we look at ARM as a company that builds out IP. And from that IP, people can then actually build their value on top of it. So our model is quite often a little different, is that we often are coming at it from a perspective, especially if you think about telecom, is helping to establish the ecosystem and build into the partnerships and create those introductions. Quite often what will happen with ARM is I'll have a conversation or I'll be going in to talk about upcoming technology, things that might be on the ARM architecture roadmap, and then what comes out of it is the telcos will come to us or, or the operators, be it telco or an MSO for that matter. They'll start to ask requirements and bring out, well, look, we have these types of solutions and what we then look to establish is how do we provide the introductions and also help to do the enablement of either around things on early level POCs or the engagement if you're thinking about it from a perspective of how do we get that foot in the door because we can bring from the ARM brand the ability to actually bring in that part of the ecosystem. Examples where that's been recently going on around, um, I'll use the term IoT, sorry, but IoT security has been an area where security is a significant area and that security as you start thinking about those 
very small endpoints that are going to start to ship in the billions. Um, from an ARM perspective, to give you an idea, microcontrollers are M cores, about 6.4 billion of those shipped last year across all of our partners, about about the 15 billion total chips that shipped are based on the ARM architecture in 2015. So when you start thinking about that, they go 6.4, how do we start to think about consistent security? How do we think about trust? Those types of areas become those conversations, and that allows us to bring a lot of the innovative startups, if you think about all the boosts out there of the security and the areas there, we can start to bring that part of the ecosystem in and create those introductions, and more importantly, create the conversation around a common architecture, common standards, those types of areas that help to then drive that for scalability as we think about these solutions that are going across the networks and address their ecosystem of network equipment, things to that effect. How do, how do you do that, besides going to a TC3 once a year? Well, yeah, TC3, activities in the standards bodies, uh, working with a variety of, I mean, the one thing about ARM is, you know, we're about 5,000 people globally, and we touch all parts of the value chain from the SIP and the, you know, SIPs and foundries all the way up into the people at the telco level and the independent ISVs in the middle. So we're engaging in, in a variety of the different standards. We engage in ecosystems. We always are trying to work in the public and create, you know, create new solutions of how do you generate open source? How do you create these capabilities? So from an ARM perspective, it's all about building the partnerships. Um, our partnerships quite often go across competitors as well. Um, but frankly speaking, if you're talking about economy of scale, quite often there's common pieces that everybody will use. And then it's adding your value on top of that. So ARM often, you know, we, we're usually trying to build the IP that is that common denominator that people can build on top of. Value is built on top of ARM. We just try to build a level playing field so you can reuse that over and over again. Great, thank you. Sure. I kind of ask a couple, three questions, but Laurent, your turn. Yes, so I will uh, illustrate uh, how Nokia works with startups, uh, actually taking uh, the example of Internet of Things. Uh, we, uh, a few months ago, uh, decided to make an acquisition of a startup called Information. And the way this happened is that we worked with Information uh, in the uh, device management space as a partner uh, for AT&T and other customers. And then we realized that this partnership uh, was actually very interesting to us and there was a significant potential. So we acquired the company, which since then has become the basis for the platform. So that's one example of interaction. You see a short partnership that moves to an acquisition. Another example of interaction is what we do with Nokia Growth Partners, which is the investment vehicle of Nokia, where we invest in startups uh, either directly or through other firms that we work with. And then the startups that are part of our portfolio are put in contact with the relevant business units so that we can go jointly towards customers. So that's the second uh, way we interact. And the third one, which is a bit lighter, is that we put in place some uh, ecosystems in some specific areas. For instance, there is one that's called NG Connect, which is focused on connected cars uh, primarily. And we invite startups to join and to share information with all the other members. So that's another form of partnership that is less, uh, less uh, stringent, let's say, but that can be a first step for cooperation with Nokia. Let me ask you this. Did anything change in that general structure of how you approach the startups or small private companies when the new Nokia came about on January? So, uh, yes, indeed, actually, uh, what changed is that uh, we, have, we are now using Nokia Growth Partners, which is an, uh, independent from Nokia in terms of management, which is run with a series of funds as a way to invest in the startups. While uh, before the, uh, the structuring of Nokia at the beginning of the year, uh, both Nokia and Alcatel Lucent were doing investments directly from the business units that were interested in two specific startups. So now we have moved this up. And the benefit is that, um, well, there, first there is more, uh, more money available for investing, so that's good for startups. And also we are able ourselves from, uh, from the Nokia Parent Corporation to use all the skills of Nokia Growth Partners, uh, the investment skills that they have that help us a lot identify the relevant startups. Great, so uh, Alcatel Lucent had Bell Labs, uh, for innovation, but they worked with some startups. Has that changed? Is, what, what role does Bell Labs have play today with the startups? 
So uh, actually, I can't speak uh, uh, quite well about this because in my previous job, I was reporting to the president of Bell Labs. And so uh, Bell Labs indeed works with startups, typically startups that are more uh, focused on truly innovative technologies. And it's actually very frequent for us to partner with startups to do tests together. The startups bring to Bell Labs uh, another way to look at a topic, which is very good, on what we bring is a technical expertise to validate the technology. So it's actually quite common for us to uh, be contacted by a business unit uh, on Ask Bell Labs, we have heard about this startup, what do you think, can you assess them? Is there value for us? So that's a lot of what Bell Labs does with startups. So obviously there, there's the question of, you think of R&D and there's the R, which is, I think of as brand new technology that somebody's inventing out there. And then there's the D, which is we need products within a year. So you have both sides of the type of uh, organizations you're looking to for. Uh, Diomedes, do you have a comment in that area? Of Are you looking for, or maybe you look for anything, but wh how do you judge? Are you looking for somebody that has product that will be in the market soon or is in the market? Do you look at pure research type of uh, opportunities? No, I mean, um, you know, even for, for, let's say, industrial companies, I mean, we're still going through this transformation of from industrial to digital company, we as Ericsson, right? We are in this journey of transforming ourselves to a truly digital company. One thing we learned from the startup community is that uh, the definition of minimum viable product and the ability to be faster in the market than later um, sometimes it's more important than the actual quality that you bring to the table in, in terms of development. So a lot of, of the first feedback and the, you know, the first feedback we get from customers, you know, whether this is a startup, whether this is our own incubation or whether this is something we invest on, I think it's so much more important for us to understand where the next uh, generation of revenue will come uh, to, to our industry. Therefore, we so, we're not so much focusing on the development part, we're so more fo focusing on the innova innovation part, as we believe this is truly what will differentiate companies in the future. Whether that is uh, technology innovation, whether that is business innovation, or whether that is services innovation, we feel that being first in the market and leading the way of an innovative product that changes the, the course of, uh, of, of the things is more important uh, nowadays than actually doing something later in a better quality. So therefore, we, we, um, we insist on great ideas, that they have a great commercialization uh, opportunity, and we try to push them hard in the market. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so we, uh, so we want to invite the audience to ask questions. <laughs> Good. So does anybody have a question? And we have mics set up. Just come to the mic. Otherwise, we'll. I'll ask questions. Okay. So the panelists have to look out now for this. So uh, here's a really great question that one of the panelists uh, we, we communicated beforehand. Uh, what's the impact on a little guy working with a big guy? So you got a 20 person or 80 person or something small company. Now they're going to work with a company that has tens of thousands of employees uh, working with many, many operators. How, how do you, what happens to the poor little guy? Do they have to add 20 people just to work with Cisco or, you know, what, what do they do? And how does it change their operation? How do they live through something like this? Looks like you're ready to talk, Diomedes. I think um, within our industry, within the telco industry, uh, uh, people realizing that uh, changing the ways of working is very fundamental for the industry. I mean, we see, you know, our industry being uh, uh, challenged, right, by whether these over the top players, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So changing mindset, um, we call this program Embrace Beta. And Embrace Beta means that you, uh, we as a vendor, um, uh, our customers and our customers' customers all need to be more receptive to innovation with, um, you know, with a faster time to market. Um, the good news within Ericsson is that the group we is leading that activity primarily is coming from the startup world. So they have a skin in the game when it comes to how to treat startups because they have been in that position. And the key differentiator, I think, in every company is to have the mandate from the top 
that this is an activity you, you're actually driving hard. Because, I mean, I, I talk to a lot of innovation offices. Uh, I'm representing a chief innovation office myself. So I talk to a lot of companies which our biggest challenge is not the true commitment from their management to really try to change the way a company works. And I think when you get that mandate, plus the DNA of people that they have been in the, the space and the thing about web scale and how I can create new generation revenues and new generation innovation, I think the game changes. A lot of times the startups are engineer heavy uh, and the business people uh, are very few to think about how can we scale or do we need to scale or if we can't scale, how do we work with Cisco? Sanjeev, you have yeah, comments here? Yeah, I, I mean, this is, look, I, I mean, there's no, you know, definite cookie cutter solution there, right? Uh, there's absolutely, this is something which is a culture, which is also deep, deep down into how that integration, you know, even before or after the acquisition occurs also with any of the technology, whether it is a partner or, uh, let's say that the company has been acquired. I, I think that cultural shift and the change is the fundamental thing. Obviously, in the bigger companies, there are different processes which needs to go through and a smaller company coming out, you know, one person is doing everything. Um, so there is that shift and uh, at least what we have been able to do uh, based on our experience within Cisco is, you know, the initial period when a company, smaller company is acquired, there is an integration process as well as, we also have adopted few models where that company, you know, s stays as a standalone for some time. So it, it really depends on the technology or the area we are talking about. Um, we did the acquisition of a company called Miraki uh, a couple of years back. To think about it, we, uh, Miraki has a separate model uh, separate go-to-market than how we, and we have been able to go after that market pretty effectively. So uh, that's, a, that's a good example, right? Well, I know last year I visited, I was in Kista and I visited TLF and it was, uh, man, I've never seen a Cisco office that looked like this. You know, they're, they're still a very independent uh, company and it's, actually, it's the Cisco's benefit that they yeah. can, continue to be innovative yeah. and independent. I, I mean, look, we as a company are changing ourselves as well. I mean, if you come to Cisco's offices right now, that would look like a startup, right? <laughs> uh, it would, it's all open workplace and so forth. We are changing that and our CEO has been really pushing hard to build that uh, more, uh, even within uh, the company to have uh, those kind of thought process of how can you work as a startup and so forth, right? So uh, things are shifting. If we don't change, somebody else will. Yeah, so. so Laurent, what, what do you see as differences? Are there any differences in the way that you approach or that you want a startup to approach you in Europe versus North America versus Asia, for example? So there are, there are a few differences in the uh, regional ways to operate. What we notice as a global company is that in the US or in the, or on Canada, so in North America, uh, with the startups, we are always going to go very fast on this is going to be a one-to-one -one relationship between a startup and ourselves. In Europe, by contrast, uh, the culture makes people want to work more together in consortium ways or in structures that involve more players. So as a startup in Europe, if we are involved, we'll most likely put you in touch also with other startups, with other large companies that complement us. So many more players. Uh, on the side effect of this is that the timeline will be longer. So as soon as you uh, work with startups based in Europe or for the European market, expect that things will take more time. That's for me is a big difference. Anyone else want to comment on regional differences? Yeah, I mean, from a from a perspective with our with our perspective here on the arm side, is that my team, since I have responsibility for people in Japan, China as well, we'll we see different moves with the with those startups engaging. So, for instance, startups coming from the U.S. that want to engage with an operator in in China, for instance, there's a there's an education piece there that we provide as well. From a perspective of most of the people on my team have been working 
in one capacity or another, either coming out of the startup industry or also having worked with terriers, I've kind of got both in my background of 20 years in between startups and working with terriers and MSOs. Um, is advising them on those types of things as well. So going into China is a great example. Of someone I've had stars like, we want to go to China. Well, it, that's a very simple thing to say. It's a much more complicated thing to actually implement and take to, take to market, right? And so those types of being able to advise on those things and drive someone to say, well, maybe you should look at this perspective here and even help to define, well, you know, maybe you directly into China doesn't make sense, but here's a partner you can actually go into China because they bring that to bear. And those are sometimes where I can actually bring those types of strategies in as we look at addressing the greater ecosystem. And it's important sometimes because people can want to run ahead and, and pivot the whole company to China. You don't see it as much as you used to, but those are things that you kind of drive through pretty quickly. Can okay. you comment about Japan? I think you have some recent experiences here. Well, right, and so, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so one thing with ARM is for everybody in the room, right, so we were, uh, ARM went from being a public company to being a private company acquired by SoftBank Holding Group about mm, three and a half weeks ago. Uh, and so from a Japan perspective, right, we are a privately held company now within SoftBank Holdings. There are some MNOs that are part of that with Sprint being one part as a publicly traded company and then SoftBank, the MNO being another. Um, the Japan market uh, traditionally has been much more vertically integrated. The one thing I will say is that we've actually seen in the last, I'd say, two years a, a real switch where now we're starting to see things where they actually are looking for outside coming in and it's kind of opening up a market that has traditionally been much more vertical from the baseline up. So it's actually now some startups that have wanted to, you know, where there's an opportunity to engage is actually now bringing them in and creating that door to open that up. Um, it's been a nice area where you can actually start to engage as well. And it's been a different spin. Any other comments on? Uh, I would like to, uh, to add something on actually on your previous question, which is what changes when you start working with a large company? Uh, on a few key points for me, the first is the, the management of the workload. Uh, the large companies might actually swamp you with requests. So the first thing to do is to know how to prioritize and decide to prioritize. Otherwise, you're just going to be overwhelmed. It's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, um, from a legal perspective, what I would say, what I always say to startups is, we are very fair in the way we set up relationship with startups. One of the reasons, frankly, is that we are much more exposed than you are, uh, because we have the money. So uh, we've learned to protect ourselves by being uh, very fair to the startups. And the advice I always give is, do not. Uh, try and modify agreements thinking that you have a specific case to take into account. It will just slow down the process. Um, the third point, uh, which is actually very beneficial to startups that are in the uh, hardware space, but also in the software space, is that you can leverage the procurement capabilities of the large company you are working with. That's extremely powerful. It's going to allow you, if you design products, to lower your cost because we will use our influence to help you with your suppliers. Uh, if you are in the software space, we'll help with the uh, software vendors as well. So that's a strong benefit, the procurement aspect. Uh, and to conclude, I think uh, the last point that matters when you work with a large company is that the timeline in general is going to expand. The large companies never work, no matter what they say, as fast as the startups do. So you need to anticipate that things that you believe are going to take just a few weeks, will take maybe twice more. And this is the nature of the large corporations. Uh, and I find that startups sometimes um, do not anticipate this enough and become trapped, for example, on funding because the interaction has required more time. So the timeline for me matters. Yeah, uh, I, I, I just want, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to add, I, I mean, obviously vendors is one of the options. It's not the, obviously the startups, they, they, totally understand how to go and approach the carrier and so forth. Uh, as my colleague was saying, you know, it's it, sometimes, and we had some discussion earlier that it may take a lot of time for them to get to the right people in the operator's environment and so forth. Working with a larger vendor sometimes shortens that, right? And especially with the relationship in sales and so forth, you can accelerate some of those aspects working with the uh, the other aspect, working with the vendor, is also about scale, right? The scaling, it's not just about how you work with the vendor, but it's how you scale your small business into different geographies. 
the bigger companies have those presence, they have the reach, they have the ecosystem, and uh, that helps the smaller company to reach. And I think uh, those are some of the things I would also consider, right? Yeah, it is. No, I mean, uh, I agree. I mean, for, for every developer out there, you know, the only thing that he has in mind is to run his code all around the world, right? This is the web scale, what we call. And, you know, companies like Ericsson, Cisco, Nokia, they can offer this great sales uh, capability for them. This compensates sometimes um, the acceleration of the, of the scale, as you said, it compensates sometimes the difficulty of, of all these internal processes that they, they have in bigger companies. Having said that, I think we as a, a you know, industry, we also need to adapt our processes to facilitate velocity because at the end of the day, it's all about speed in, in our mm -hmm. industry nowadays. So yes, we, we, we can maybe scale their, um, their, their processes, but one thing our industry learned is that if we don't get things faster, people will just bypass them and do it on their own. Yep. So it will take them a little bit of time, it will take them a little bit of brain power, but they will manage to do what they want to do anyway. Well, speaking of scale, there's the scale of the actual project itself. Carriers are very famous for saying, examining a new product and say, that's great. But what we need are tw a list of 20 more features added to it. How does this little company deal with that? Or how do you intercede? Uh, wh what happens there? How, how do you help a little guy who can't hire two times the, their engineering force just to get this one carrier's list of 20 top items. I, I think um, there, are, there are two problems into this, right? One is when you uh, interface a larger company, uh, one of the things that can happen is that you ending up being a requirement house for that larger company. And it takes a lot of guts, right? And a lot of believing your vision as a CEO of a startup to stick to, your, to the course and to the vision that you have in order to to really deliver what you really have in mind versus delivering a requirement space from a bigger company. That, that's one. The second one is if you both agree on a common vision, right, is um, the time to market of your vision being executed versus, to, uh, versus what the customer expects. And then sometimes they expect more requirements, sometimes they expect more quality, sometimes they expect more. But one thing our industry learned is that, you know, um, getting feedback and, and closing that loop of the first minimum viable product that is out there, it's so much more important than having the full functionality. Because if people love it, if you manage to touch their heart and they like what they see, they will be willing to wait. I mean, every one of us is a consumer. If we like something, we like a car, if we like an iPhone, we will wait for it, right? So I think that is a lesson that we learn. And, and at the end of the day, it's also like for operators, you know, they love to work with the smaller companies because they would, you know, see uh, and, you know, sometimes reciprocate what the operators are looking for. Larger companies, sometimes there is a lot of process to say, hey, we may not be able to do that. There is sometimes a pushback. Obviously, it depends on the business and so forth. So that give and take is always there. Um, there's a pros and cons, right? Um, you could have a direct entry. I mean, the previous two panels which we just discussed had a good uh, uh, discussion around those, right? If you say yes to everything, then you cannot scale. And um, so how do you balance that? Great, any question? Okay, we got one question. We have time for only one question, go ahead. No, I guess I'm pretty lucky then. All right, um, so uh, Laurent had brought up something that I thought was interesting, mentioning that uh, they strive to be startup friendly in contract negotiation and, and things like that. I think that's what you were getting at. And uh, as, a, as a company in the US, but doing business multinationally, uh, we often run into an issue where um, you know, the other party wants to have the law and jurisdiction of their native country. And so I'm wondering, uh, it could be for you, Laurent, but for any of you, um, how, from your side of the table, how do you address that? Do you just expect the smaller company to, oh well, deal with it or compromise? or work with the US subsidiary, and of course it doesn't have to be US, just the general concept is you might have supplier in one country and, and vendor in the other country. And uh, I've recently run into this with, with working with companies in, in China, and it can, be, can end up a, a fairly large stumbling block. Yeah, so I can, uh, I can respond for Nokia, we, uh, because I've signed a fair share of, uh, of agreements. Uh, the way it works is we always select the, the country on the law of the country where the startup operates. 
we have affiliates in the country. We know it makes it easier for the, for the startup. So if I work with a startup based in Israel, I'm going to use Nokia Israel for this. Mm -hmm. Same in China with Nokia Shanghai Bell and so on. It simplifies things. Then the second element is that uh, because of the structure of the company, what is signed by one affiliate in one country then is leveraged across the entire corporation. So for example, if I sign now uh, an agreement with a specific startup, uh, as an officer of uh, Nokia US, I am actually engaging the entire company, but the specifics will be based in the US because the startup was based in the US. So that's the way we make it uh, easier for the startups. Thank you. Well, with that, we're 20 seconds left on our panel. I'd like to say thank you very much. I learned a lot here today. So thank you, panel. Thank you. <laughs> Michael. Uh, thanks also to you. Good job. Like thank a great you. panel. Uh, we learned a lot, and I think uh, we learn about the cha different channels, and I'll probably recap it in about one minute when we do the recap. So thanks to you, and thanks to your panelists.